Okay, Steve, let's start. Hello, uh, good morning. And also good afternoon to our friend Serge in France and also our other colleagues from Europe and also our Asian, uh, particularly the Chinese colleague. Now it's 10 p.m. and also 11 p.m. Our Japanese colleagues, Yoshi, our very good friend, Yoshi is still in his office. Okay, uh, uh, welcome again to this World River and Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. So today we get uh, Professor Steve Gubrad to talk about the Ganges Bhumaputra River Delta. And so before I introduce Steve, I will mention this Friday, uh, the same time we have uh, Professor Peter Clift. Uh, he will talk about other Himalaya derived river system, the Indus River catchment, um, you know, about the monsoon influence uh, the, on the erosion and sediment transport. So mm -hmm. uh, please mark your calendar, come back same time next Friday. And also Steve, uh, as you can see here, he graduated uh, from Boston University and then uh, get a master degree from University of South Florida. And then 1994, uh, he moved to Virginia Institute of Marine Science working with Professor uh, Steve Kew and graduated in 90, 1999. So I came to Wims 97, Steve and I, we have two years overlap. And actually, our office, Steve, I hope you still remember our office building called White House. And we, we, share, we have an a office next to each other and in the White House. We have water view. It's pretty, pretty nice, but of course not there anymore. And so uh, Steve's uh, uh, research is on the coastal sediment wetland delta system, particularly he's very, very, very well known about his study in the Beng uh, Bengal Basin and the Ganges Brahmaputra River and the Delta. Um, recently, he also working on a couple of uh, Atlantic and Gulf Coast wetland, also most recently in some uh, South America, the uh, uh, geoarchaeology research in coastal Peru. So uh, as, it, as we mentioned in 1999, he started his uh, faculty career as a system professor in Stony Brook. Then he shifted to uh, uh, Vanderbilt in 2005. And currently uh, he's the professor and also the chair of the department. Uh, Steve was a, a Coverley or Coverley fellow with the National Academy of Science in 2011 and also a DSA fellow. So uh, um, he's a, a very good colleague and a friend. So Steve, uh, we are looking forward to your talk and please uh, share your screen and put into a presentation mode. Excellent, Paul. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. Paul, I just want to say hi to so many people I see out there. Thanks, thanks for joining in. I guess I've gotten to enjoy uh, everyone's talks this fall, so I, I suppose it's only fair that I'm in the hot seat at some point. So, um, Let's see. Well, I really thought I was going to give an overview of the work we, we've done in Bangladesh over the last 25 years, but that quickly became uh, an, an impossibility. So I did, did choose a, a focus, and, and we'll get into that in a second. Of course, this work reflects, I mean, as you can see, the cast of characters down, down at the bottom there of so many people over a career of students, postdocs, colleagues in Bangladesh and Europe and the US. So uh, shout out to, to all of those, those folks. Um, and especially Steve Keel, um, who got me started there 25 years ago. And, and Steve, I guess I'm, I'm still working on my dissertation. <laughs> I've never, never left. So um, I think with this crew, we mostly know where we are but it, it's always impressive to, to look at it, some oblique image of, of the Indian subcontinent colliding with, uh, with Asia, the uh, Himalayan origin and arc system there and the Tibetan plateau. Um, of course, the, the Ganges drains about two thirds of the four slope um, meeting here with the Brahmaputra in the Bengal basin the Brahmaputra, of course, draining uh, about similar two thirds of, of the back slope and, and Tibet around the Syntaxis. So two of the world's great rivers converging here um, on this 
which is really just a, a, a trailing edge margin, but uh, this trailing edge margin happens to be uh, colliding along two boundaries that I'll show in a second. And, and Mike Steckler will talk more about this in, in his talk. So um, there's been so many great talks on coastal dynamics and sediment transport. There are a bunch of people that could give a great talk on this, like Kimberly Rogers, Carol Wilson, Rip Hale, others. Um, so I'm not going to focus on that today, but I, I did at least want to give you a, a teaser of what we've been doing in the coastal region for, I guess, almost the last 10 years now, um, because it, it's really pretty impressive. Um, so I'll, I'll just zoom in on this area in the yellow box here for a second and uh, give you a, a quick tour. Um, so here's the yellow box. Um, this area, we're talking about 20,000 square kilometers of tidal delta plain. This is only one fifth of the delta, but the 20,000 square kilometers is almost twice as big as the Mississippi. Um, it contains the world's largest mangrove forest down here, the Schinderbonds. Um, and one of the things I wanted to point out in this one minute is these tidal channels. Here we are about 80 to 100 kilometers inland of the coast. And this tidal channel here, uh, Rip Hale and Rachel Bain have done a bunch of ADC, ADCP surveys. Um, and we find that the tidal discharge there, like for a couple hours a day um, during the high discharge, is equivalent to the monsoon discharge of the Ganges River or the Brahmaputra. They're, they're approximately equivalent. So here we're looking at multiple tidal channels across this region that have similar uh, transport capacity as, as the main stem rivers. That really was uh, impressive. And again, you know, uh, up to 100 kilometers inland. So um, all the craziness sets in. These green lines are all embankments that were built in the 1960s and 70s as part of flood control and for uh, increased uh, food production uh, for rice paddy cultivation. Um, and so that was a tremendous change in the hydrodynamics of, of the region when those embankments went in. And one of the consequences, Carol Wilson documents this very nicely in a recent paper, is that over 600, kilo or, yeah, 600 kilometers of these waterways have silted in. And these channels were 300 meters wide. So there's a tremendous amount of sediment. These aren't small creeks closing up. Another effect of this has been the fact that mean high water has been rising at a rate of a centimeter to over a centimeter and a half per year for the last 50, 30, 50 years or so. And so there's been an increase in the tidal range, even though the mean sea level is only rising at a half centimeter per year, people are experiencing and the landscape is experiencing a rate of relative sea level rise three times that. So a lot of interesting dynamics. Um, oh, I'll, I'll point out that this channel in yellow here lost most of its upper basin, as you can see where all of these channels filled in. However, this channel, the Pusur, continues up and connects with a, a distributary of the Ganges. And so one of the things that happened when uh, the Sheepshub River here lost its headwaters is that the tide wave actually shifted its, its energy and propagation route through these connector channels and is actually undergoing a basin capture with the Pusur River. And that diversion of discharge has led to a widening of these channels in pink. Um, so we have some channels that are infilling, others that are scouring and widening. And one of the, the human dimensions of that is this island or polder in, in blue here um, had a catastrophic failure of its embankments uh, in 2009 uh, following a cyclone, similar to what happened with uh, Katrina and, um, and the post-storm breaches there. And the island had actually, uh, the elevation offset after 50 years of being cut off led to two years of tidal flooding before they could uh, repair the embankments. And in that time, there is 20 centimeters per year of tidal sedimentation in that system. 
So these are some of the interrelated morphodynamic uh, feedbacks that have been uh, going on in the coast. And obviously, we're not, I won't read through this, but if anyone wants to scroll back, um, these are a bunch of the publications just in the last three, four, five, six, seven years, um, sort of documenting all of that. So I did want to give a shout out to that, because um, I know it may be of interest to, to many. Um, but today I want to do a little bit bigger picture, um, kind of the stuff that got me interested in, in the Bengal Delta. Um, I guess broadly, the, the interest is in understanding the delivery and dispersal of Himalayan sediment. What's going on in the, uh, in the catchment that's uh, yielding sediment um, and that delivery here to uh, the, the basin, which is about 120,000 square kilometers of active depositional area. Um, and so we have these two point sources, right? The, the Ganges is constrained between um, uh, the uh, hills, I'm drawing a blank on the name, um, and then the uh, Brahmaputra is also uh, anchored up here. So we have these you know, less than 10 kilometer wide point sources fixed up here at the head of the basin. And then we have this vast deltaic landscape, uh, low lying, all less than 20 meters in elevation. And then again, this uh, narrow, less than 10 kilometers wide uh, exit down here at the, the Swatch of No Ground Canyon um, that feeds the Bengal fan. So I'm interested in, in how sediment is delivered, how it builds the delta, and uh, ultimately how signals from the Himalaya, the monsoon, the tectonics are preserved or modified or attenuated uh, through the delta and to better understand what escapes down here to the long-term fan record. So, you know, some of the motivations for this and other folks are interested in this. This is just a, a quick capture from a nice paper by Mike Bloom, Kimberly Rogers and others um, came out uh, two years ago, I guess. Um, you know, looking at allogenic and autogenic signatures in, in the stratigraphic record of the fan. And, you know, Mike put out the idea that you could explain a lot of the variability in the fan, not by what's happening up in the Himalaya or with the monsoon, but simply through autogenic dynamics on, on the delta. Um, so we've chatted about that and, and he, he agrees that it's more of a, a, a motivator of putting that out there that certainly it's, it's more complex than that. And so I was sort of excited to uh, build on that idea of allergenic and autogenic signals today. And so that's what I'm gonna, gonna focus on. So I'll focus on the allergenic first because I think they're one of the more unique dimensions of the Ganges Delta um, because of the tectonics, because of the proximity to the Himalaya um, there's some interesting things uh, that have, have arisen. And if, if there's time, I'll, uh, I'll try and say a little bit about autogenic processes there at the end, similar to like the coastal summary that I just did. So um, we'll start with tectonics. Um, it, it seems like a no brainer that tectonic deformation of the Delta should be a, a key player. Um, it's actually a really tough signal to capture. Um, you've got these massive rivers that are constantly reworking the upper stratigraphy. So a lot of the faults and fault offsets and earthquake uh, evidence gets rewritten, it gets uh, reworked. And so it's actually taken quite a long time to tease out and to be honest, accidentally discover um, some of the, the, the tectonic signatures. One of the first we accidentally discovered, we affectionately call Brahmaputra in the sky, and I'll start there. So um, this is from uh, Mike Steckler's paper, um, locked and loaded uh, along the mega thrust uh, here, looking at earthquake uh, hazard. Um, but what I want to point out, if, if you're not aware, is that the Andaman Sumatran subduction zone that extends down here and of course ruptured in the, the 2004 uh, earthquake and tsunami in the Indian Ocean extends right up on through the middle of the Bengal Basin in the Delta. However, 
it's it's blind and buried and we're really not entirely sure where it is. Uh, I think Mike's converging that this is a pretty good location for it. But here we see this active thrust front in the middle of the delta. And yet we can't even really be sure, you know, we can't put our finger on, on showing it. There's, there's some good evidence that I'm sure Mike will get into. Um, so we'll talk a bit about that in, in a second on the Meghna, but first we'll start up here around the Shillong Massif. And the, the north convergence here is along a, a steep thrust front, again, blind and buried. Um, and so that's what we'll uh, take a look at. And, and just, I mentioned that this is a, a trailing edge margin. Here's the, the hinge zone uh, across. This is Craton up here, only uh, 100 meters or 200 meters below the surface, you have Cratonic bedrock. And you go from 200 meters deep to 20,000 meters deep. So this plunges down into uh, one of the thickest uh, sediment deposits in, in the world. So, um, here is a, a DEM of the, the lovely um, Shillong Massif. This is a, an actively faulted anti-formal crust block. Um, it's just gorgeous to look at, if nothing else. Um, and the Brahmaputra River comes down here through Assam, India, and you can just make it out, comes around the western edge here of, of the Shillong Massif. And here, here are this, the main thrust, the, the Dauki fall, and then it splits into the Dapsi and the Dauki here. It's like a pair of jaws and it's sort of uh, appropriate. I'm gonna zoom in here on this area here, these hills that sit down at, at the foot of the uh, Western edge of the Shillong Massif. So here's an oblique view. Um, again, here's the, the Brahmaputra coming around. We're looking uh, east here. Um, you can see the fault offset along the, uh, the Dapsi fault. And then of course, this is marking uh, the, the Dauki fault. It's a little more blind and reworked, um, but you can see lovely fluvial cut margins right along the edges of this. And the Brahmaputra river um, episodically, you know, locates along here and, and reworks that margin. But these hills, if you walk into them, this is what they look like. And uh, we had finally made our way up into this really rural part of, of Bangladesh and strolled up into these hills. And what was absolutely fantastic to discover is that these hills were old Brahmaputra uh, delta plane deposits that had been uplifted. So here cleaning up this outcrop right at the base here, right, this 15 meter thick outcrop. Here at the base, we have these beautiful meter scale tabular cross beds that are just classic Brahmaputra bar deposits. And I'll, I'll show you a modern uh, example of that in, in a minute. And uh, so Jen Pickering, as part of her dissertation, explored these hills and, and got way back in and found some other fantastic outcrops of, of these all fine to medium, well-sorted sand with meter scale cross beds. And so this, this is our Brahmaputra in the sky to, to look at a river we'd been studying for 15 years at that point and to be able to see a relatively fresh outcrop, uh, you know, sitting up here uh, 25, 50 meters above, above uh, the uh, surrounding floodplain was, was quite exciting and obviously an indication of active tectonic uplift. So at the top of these hills, um, it, it's just the perfect bar deposit. You go from the, these large uh, cross-bedded systems to beautifully laminated at the very bar top and then the bar top is capped in a meter or two of floodplain muds uh, right up here. And so just perfectly preserved um, of, of the braid belt system. And so here are some of the modern photos um, from the system. You can see the, the scale of, of bar deposits and, and you know, what, what Brahmaputra in the sky looks like uh, when it's, it's actively forming, the nice uh, floodplain cap there. So um, anyway, that was uh, 
sort of an eye-opening indicator of, of tectonic deformation, not only of uplifting those deposits, but as you saw, the Brahmaputra River runs right along the margin. And so clearly we can now show that the Brahmaputra in the not too recent past actually flowed over this area, um, forming active braid belt uh, bar systems um, and has been uplifted. Uh, these are a series of um, PIRIR uh, feldspar uh, luminescence ages. We, we need to get some more constraints on this, but we see it probably would go back pre stage five into stage seven or nine or so um, that these have been uplifted since. Um, and this also ties together with this area over here which is also shallow exposed Pleistocene sediments that date apparently maybe back around the stage five high stand. And so uh, Jen's working on a manuscript for this, but uh, the, the case to be made is that here we can actually map out the stage seven or nine high stand delta for the Brahmaputra far over here in the west and tectonic deformation both at the, uh, at the advancing fold belt and along the western margin of Shillong Plateau has forced the river um, during the last high stand, stage five, far west of where it is today. And so all of the sedimentary Pleistocene deposits in the western part of the delta are actually Brahmaputra in origin. And the only reason the river should be over this far um, is if it were tectonically steered. And in fact, these deposits are quite gravelly. And so it's pretty clear that the river's picking up gravels at this uplift site. Um, and then finally, um, as we'll show in a second, when I get to the mega floods, is that the river in the last low stand has migrated to its modern position. So there's a large low stand valley here that the Holocene Delta has, is infilled in the last bit. So um, none of this is fluvial autogenics. This is some significant uh, avulsion, delta lobe construction um, driven primarily by, by tectonic deformation. So um, this is from so many papers and students and colleagues that we get lots of different images. These are some lovely images from paper that Jean-Louis Grimaud, a postdoc with Chris Paola and Celine Grawl, who postdoc with Mike Steckler and, and all of us. The two of them led this, this lovely paper that looked at those exposed Pleistocene outcrops just adjacent to the Garo Hills where we just were. So this is the uh, probably the stage five high stand delta here exposed at the surface. And um, Jean-Louis and Celine did some lovely modeling about flexural loading back here in the Foreland Basin, which is capturing the Tista River fan deposits here. And the Tista is onlapping with these exposed Pleistocene, just as the Holocene GB is onlapping against its, its old uh, surface there. And we can distinguish these deposits by a, a lovely strontium signal um, here we can see the nice histogram of Brahmaputra derived sediments and the lower concentrations for the Batista. So in, in John Louis's uh, nice uh, schematic here, you know, we have the Brahmaputra coming around um, and here's the exposed Pleistocene. And uh, over here in, in the red, this is the strontium and you can see that all of those deposits are uh, high strontium of, of the Brahmaputra and that they're sort of overlain by more recent um, deposits from, from the Tista system. And so here's a, a cross section um, showing their schematic. Uh, Celine had done nice modeling of this in terms of the flexural loading um, and deformation of the system. You can see the more, the younger Tista fan and Ganges Delta onlapping to this surface. So this is just a nice example of, of sort of tectonic steering um, and long-term deformation that's really building the template along which the, um, the Holocene Delta has, is formed. 
right? This is a, an active surface that, that the uh, you know, post-glacial sea level rise has sort of intersected and constructed the modern delta. So that's uh, Brahmaputra in the sky. Um, I want to shift down to um, an example of, of steering the Meghna River, um, which I'll show you where that is, and uh, which is also the old path of the Brahmaputra. Um, and Mike Steckler will probably talk more about this. I only have a couple of slides. But um, we'll shift down here to a series of cores, a core transect that we did between uh, a Pleistocene highland here, the Matapur Terrace, across the Magna River Valley here, and uh, up to the, the fold belt, um, or the Bangladesh border there. So zooming in, uh, these are all of our sediment cores from the large um, NSF Pyre project that we had going, thankfully, for, for many years. Um, and then here is, is the Meghna Valley. I'll just point out that this is an alternate course for the Brahmaputra. It uh, periodically evulses into uh, this course here along the edge of Silet Basin and out through this outlet. And otherwise, it's dominated by uh, discharge from the Meghna River and Surma Kushiara system up here that drains the rainiest place in the world, um, Cherrapunji, India, with eight meters of, of rainfall uh, per year. So this is that uh, transect of cores from, from west across the, the Meghna Valley um, over to the fold belt there. Um, you're seeing down about 60, 70 meters worth of sediment. Um, the orange line represents the Holocene Pleistocene boundary, and blue is mud, yellow fine sand, and orange medium sand. Um, and let's see, what do I want to point out? Well, I want to point out that most of the sand and most contiguous sand is over here on the western side of the basin. Um, and over here, we can actually see uh, a new anticline or a younger anticline sticking above the, the onlapping delta deposits. And then here are, are younger antiforms that extend out below, below the delta uh, out, out here at the advancing uh, accretionary prism. So let's see, I've got next slide. Um, if we focus in on the elevation, we can see this is typical flat floodplain here. But on this part of the system, we see there's actually a, a pretty decent gradient for this system, um, three times 10 to the minus fourth, which is steeper than anywhere else on the fluvial system in the delta. And so clearly that's part of the tectonic deformation. And Basically, the base of that starts, or you know, it's a little gap, but uh, it, it's that tilting and deformation of the thrust front that seems to steer the Brahmaputra River and keep it over here. And in fact, these Pleistocene muds are highly weathered and very stiff. And the uh, river has carved this beautiful strath terrace right here where we hit that tough Pleistocene surface at the same depth across all of these cores capped by uh, beautiful Brahmaputra sands. So this is not as an extreme an example as the advancing uh, Shillong Massif, but here this shallow angle uh, fold belt advancing is having a gentle steering effect and certainly controlling uh, where the river is, is going. Um, Oh, uh, I mentioned we could use the strontium to track the, the, the sediment sources. And so here, you um, can also use magnetic susceptibility. So strontium, magnetic susceptibility, and the dark blue and black colors are pure Brahmaputra. And you can see those are pinned right over here on, on that side of, of the system. So uh, we're not just calling these Brahmaputra, we can actually uh, track them. The other cool thing, Going back to the long-term deformation, remember I was talking about the stage seven or nine delta that the um, Shillong Massif had, had shifted? Well, here under the Lao Mai anticline is this beautifully preserved pure Brahmaputra deposit there from, from the Pleistocene that's been uplifted in the folding. 
So a, a gorgeous signal that the, the river had been there um, in, in the not so distant past. So these are all the sorts of tectonic signals that have just slowly revealed themselves and were not something we could really effectively go out and say, this is gonna be it. Just uh, we're thankful to, to come upon them. So last, speaking of coming upon something, um, there's a, a new thing that we wanna show, switching over to the Ganges. So we'll call it shaking up the Ganges. And um, I've been working with this, um, on this project with Liz Chamberlain, um, postdoc, and who'll be starting a faculty position at Wageningen University next year. Um, so she's worked in the Mississippi Delta uh, for her dissertation with uh, Tor Tornquist and uh, is a real expert in luminescence dating. So that's been a, a big, big help in, in studying the Delta. So uh, Liz and I are working on what is the role of these beautiful little distributaries we see coming off of the Ganges. They typically transport no more than 10% of the discharge and they're ephemeral. They only last a few hundred years. They're really dynamic. And you see they peter out down here. So the hypothesis is that there's enough sediment in these little guys to offset uh, subsidence. So you're not really building landscape, but you are filling in accommodation. And we're wondering if that actually affects the avulsion period of the, uh, the main stem river, because it's not building a lateral gradient uh, as effectively because it's such a leaky system. So in any case, um, Liz is talking more about this at AGU, so there's a shout out for her. Um, come on, advance there. We're gonna go on this little box here, and I wanna draw your attention to this kind of low spot right here and see a little purple right in there. This is sort of a window underneath these uh, small distributary deposits. So there's our window. And what drew us to this spot were these large meander scars here. And you see they're quite a bit larger in scale than the little distributaries that, that come off. You know, they're not that little, but relatively compared. So we said, huh, what's that? Let's go explore. Well, here it is in Google Earth and you can see it's low lying, it's rice cultivated. And here's the meander bend. It's unfilled with sand. That's really unusual. These rivers have so much sand, so much discharge, that even in the abandonment phase, when rivers evolve away, they almost always backfill the channels with sand. You don't find these muddy oxbows sitting uh, around unfilled with peats in them. There's just so much sediment and discharge, they get filled in. So this was a bit of a, a novelty. And we did core in here, and it is partly full of mud, but certainly not sand. So as a cup, it's the scale of the Ganges, not filled, what, what, what gives? Here's looking across that channel, um, you can see it's low lying. Um, and along the edge, along the, uh, the levee over here on the road, we passed a, a drained fish pond right here. And it's kind of cruddy, you can see it doesn't look like you can see too much, there's dirt clogs everywhere. We drove past it and said, huh, Let's go back. What else are we over here for? So we scraped around in it and you know saw typical floodplain deposits, nothing, nothing too crazy. And we're on our way back out on the trail right here when something caught our eye about a little sand layer that was cross-cutting the muds, scraped it up, and sure enough, there's this beautiful sand layer. I thought, huh, oh, that must be you know, uh, some sort of anthropogenic fill because they were obviously reworking the edges, but kept scraping away. Fast forward, what we found in this pond as we started looking around were some absolutely fantastic sand dikes. Um, so here, these are 30, 40 centimeters wide of beautiful clean sand that breaches a four meter thick floodplain cap here. Um, so immediately thought this is an, an earthquake indicator. These are seismites, these are paleo seismites. And so Liz has been working on uh, luminescence dating for them and, and we'll have a, a, a bigger story to come out from this, but wanted to introduce them here. So 
one of the things we were excited about is not only was this evidence for an earthquake, we know it's tectonically active area. What was novel was that it was located right next to this very strange, large abandoned channel. And our thinking was that the only way it didn't get filled with sand is if it was an abrupt and remote avulsion and that that meander was completely cut off from any further sediment input. Um, so we think maybe there's not only uh, an earthquake, obviously, but um, also may have caused uh, a immediate and large scale avulsion of the Ganges. Um, this is a close up of a, a fine sand layer within the floodplain cap. And you'll see that it was pretty well uh, liquefied or deformed in the earthquake. That suggested to us that these must be pretty young deposits at the time. Otherwise, this would have this sand would have compacted um, if it were a thousand or plus years old during the event. So we think this was the active floodplain, and it was wet and oversaturated, and and that's partly why it it went so crazy. Um, so again, yeah, there's there's the the case. So this is sort of what we're we're working through. Um, it's hard to get an idea of the magnitude, but um, a few magnitude indicators for the size of a potential earthquake is distance from of the liquefaction feature from the ground failure. We don't know where that would be, but the nearest potential is about 100 kilometers away, um, which would be consistent with a large scale earthquake. Um, as with the fact that these sand dikes are, again, 30 centimeters wide, that would again put them in, in more of the upper echelon of, of, um, of earthquake magnitudes. So um, Mike is helping us with some modeling on that and it's been fun to work on this. So um, also point out here, here are the two sand dikes there and there and you can trace them. This it goes right across, not exactly straight line but across the pond and both of these are oriented perfectly east-west. Um, and so here's the site of the seismites and here's the, the thrust front from, uh, from the fold belt about a hundred kilometers away. So a lot more to do here, um, but again, another interesting example um, of, of tectonic influence on, on the system. So really exciting and all of these were more or less accidentally discovered. Um, field work's kind of addictive that way, isn't it? Uh, we wouldn't go out and get hot and sweaty and muddy for, for no reason, or, or maybe we would, <laughs> to be honest. So um, yeah, so this ties in nicely with um, some lovely theory and modeling that uh, Meredith Wrights did when she was postdocing with, with Chris Paola. And so Meredith applied her channel avulsion model that she did with, with Doug Gerald Mack, um, looking at, at rates of subsidence and basin tilting, um, aggradation rates of the river, and basically showed that um, the rate of tectonic tilting is fast enough to likely influence the river, but it was fairly comparable to the river aggradation itself. So the two may be fairly uh, similar in, in their magnitude. What, what we're thinking at the moment is that um, certainly autogenic processes could set a system up for the potential to evulse, and perhaps it's earthquakes or floods that might be the evulsion trigger that actually induces the event. So something we hope to explore in continuing work. Yeah, so, so that's tectonics. Um, let me tell you about mega floods. It sounds dramatic, it is. So um, back in 2004, um, Dave Montgomery, University of Washington um, was working up in the Syntaxis area. And uh, this was a, a it's like a quaternary research note or letter or something, fairly short paper, but they had found uh, an, an ice dammed, um, ice dam site along the Songpo River, the upper reaches of the Brahmaputra, and then had recognized uh, slack water and lake deposits up 
uh, along the margin here and was able to reconstruct uh, that there had been a large ice dammed lake um, dated back to around the, the beginning of the Holocene, around 10,000 years, um, and had it in a calculated volume and potential discharge up at five, potentially five million cubic meters per second. Um, so this is well over the million cubic meters per second to consider a, a, a mega flood. And since that time, there's been a lot of work from um, more of uh, uh, Dave's group and, and Kate Huntington, Carl Lang at UW have been following up on this. There's beautiful um, ice dammed lake varv deposits up there that indicate that these ice dammed lakes were a fairly common attribute or feature of, of the last glacial um, hinterland there. So uh, I'll show you briefly, right at the syntaxis here, um, here's an oblique image. Here's the uh, Songpo River, just as it starts to go down the gorge and around the syntaxis here and into Assam, India. And this is the Nam Shabarwa. This is the syntaxis with rapid uplift rates. And there's two beautiful um, uh, alpine glaciers that feed right down through here. And if we zoom in, um, here's the snout of the glacier today, but clearly it's advanced all the way down against this headland right here. So rocky headland, beautiful. These are a hundred meter high moraines that would have come across and cut off the, the Song Po, um, creating that lake. And there's lots of evidence to suggest that these were multiple uh, dams and failures um, over the, uh, the last glacial. So ever since then, I've been really curious, what does this do to, to the Delta? Well, finally, after our large, large coring campaign, where we have sediment cores across all of these areas, actually, actually able to document this. So as one of her dissertation chapters, Jen Pickering, um, with uh, help from Michael Diamond, an undergraduate Vanderbilt, now at, at UW um, PhD student, um, helped work this up and uh, look at this. So the question is, we have this really large low stand valley, but the conundrum that Jen speaks about in the title here is that the last glacial maximum and, and prior, there was a weak monsoon. It was relatively arid. The evidence for freshwater discharge to the northern Bay of Bengal is, is absent. Um, there's high salinities there. So how do you how do you get a river carving, exhuming a valley um, during a period of relatively weak monsoon? Um, the answer is it probably doesn't. Um, it is probably these, these mega floods. So um, here are the core transects. I'll, interest of time, I'll, I'll scoot on, but we have nice dimensions of the valley width. We can use the strontium, radiocarbon dating, uh, basal gravels, and oxidized sediment, all good indicators of what the, the boundaries are. So we're, we're, we're pretty confident in, in what those look like. So uh, what we did, like here, are the, here are the valleys across those cross sections. Um, we're talking about 50 to 60 kilometers wide and somewhere from 50 to 70 uh, meters uh, deep. So these are broad valleys. We know they're not composite valleys because there's a, a uniform layer of gravel across here. Um, I mean, it could be somewhat composite, but it's certainly a contiguous unit. And just for scale, guys, here is the modern Brahmaputra braid belt. So thinking about even a huge system like this, being able to exhume and scour a valley system of that magnitude um, is, is a challenge. So um, complementing this was some lovely work, a, a beautiful um, multi-channel seismic survey along the Brahmaputra River here. There's Shillong Massif, Brahmaputra through Assam, India, and down through Bangladesh. And we didn't get a lot of detail out of the unit, out of the um, seismic record. There's, there's the channel bed. But the one reflector we did get was prominent and extended all the way along the base. This is that gravel layer. And you can also see here, here's the fault offsets of, of the, the Dapsi, the Dauki, and, and there may be another fault out here. 
uh, showing up nicely in the record. So um, there's actually some nice geotechnical boreholes from the Jamuna Bridge drilled right here. And this is, this is fun. This is from a 1976 um, engineering study about building the bridge. And here are some um, cumulative grain size curves, clay, silt, sand, gravel. Um, and you see most of the facies um, in this, this core here um, that goes 80 to 90 meters deep. Are, are in the normal range. But note this unit AL1, we come up into the boulder range. And that is what that uh, seismic reflection unit is. And they describe stratum AL1 quite lovely as a well-graded gravelly bed with as big gravels as human head. And no, no joke, um, we didn't get any human heads but our drillers did regularly pull up um, ample evidence of, of this surface, um, much to their chagrin. <laughs> so um, pretty, pretty exciting work. So um, what we did, we, we took two approaches of modeling this. Um, one was to take the gravel size and calculate what type of, of bed shear we would need and if you took the uh, you know, uh, shear stress required to set these gravels in motion, um, what type of discharge are you talking about? So we varied the channel width quite a bit, but all of the um, units come out up around that mega flood uh, scale. So that would be consistent. The other thing, oh, and that mega flood scale, just for example, is a hundred times the monsoon discharge of the Brahmaputra River. So um, we also took the valley dimensions here and simply used the slope and valley dimension to uh, model uniform flow conditions. And um, so doing that with the different uh, estimated discharges essentially fill that valley up quite neatly. Um, so essentially these valleys seem to be sort of uh, a, a bank full uh, discharge uh, system for conveying these, these floods. Lots of questions coming out of this that we're exploring and in the interest of time, I'll, I'll scoot on. I, I will point out that there's other features right along the river, like these lovely margin channel margin cuts here. And we thought, oh, this has to be, or this could be the flood, right? If these were erosional, by the flood, they should be again unfilled by sand or perhaps backfilled by mud. If it was cut by the Brahmaputra, it would certainly be filled by sand. What we found was that the channels were indeed filled with muds, which was consistent with being carved by a flood and then just abandoned. But the ages all came out way too young for this. So we put that on the back burner but Kate Huntington's group and her PhD student, Mike Trzeski, just came out with a whole bunch of new uh, luminescence ages from the Songpo Gorge. And here's the original Montgomery uh, flood back about 10K, but Michael found evidence and dated in several places, another large flood at seven to eight. And so we think that might be a good candidate. And here are other floods all throughout the late Quaternary. So this seems to be a very salient part of the system. So this is good. I didn't plan to talk too much about autogenic signals, but if you'll indulge, I'll just take another five minutes um, to, to wrap this up. Because these are interesting stories, but what, what's the big picture? So um, PhD students, Ryans and Cabbage and Jen Pickering and postdoc, former postdoc Carol Wilson. We've been using these cores to map out the distribution of sediments, their characteristics, and it's beautiful. We get these gorgeous splay lobes with a uh, nice downstream fining. We get a nicely organized fan to backwater uh, gradients across the delta. The point being, when we look at the sediments and the stratigraphy and the geomorphology, it's incredibly well behaved. Here are downstream fining curves for both the Ganges and Brahmaputra from the cores. 
at all depths through the Holocene from recent to early Holocene. They all show these beautiful linear downstream finding curves that fantastically converge at 100 microns all together right down here, oops, at the modern coast. It's like, wow, this system is like a, a tank experiment with no, no perturbations. It's doing everything it, it ought to do. And even more so, here's a cross section across the entire delta of cores, lots of sand, mud, different valleys. Here's the strontium. This is Ganges, the blue is Brahmaputra, and the pink is off of the fold belt and magna. And what you see, even with these massive rivers migrating and avulsing, the stratigraphy has nary a mixed unit in it. It's almost all discrete deposits. And so I, I come back thinking about, you know, what uh, Mike Bloom was putting out about thinking about the rivers avulsing and sort of controlling what the uh, export to the fan looked like. Yet here we have this completely discrete stratigraphy in the lower delta. So lots of cool things to figure out. Um, and I'll give a final plug to my current PhD student, Jess Raff, who's presenting it at AGU uh, in a couple of days with a comprehensive sediment budget. We're using the strontium to distinguish how much Brahmaputra and Ganges, they're about equal for, for what it matters. The distribution of, of muds through coarse sands. So cool stuff that she'll be showing. So here's my conclusion slide of takeaways. There are diverse, regular and widespread allogenic forcings of the rivers. Um, these are tectonic channel steering, triggered avulsions, geomorphic uh, you know, valleys shaped by these glacial lake outburst floods, these gloffs. And I didn't even mention monsoon control on sediment supply. So all of this allogenic driver going on and we can see it's influencing the system Yet, despite all of that allogenic influence, the autogenic behavior of the river and delta seems remarkably normal. Sediment dispersal is orderly and tractable. Delta evolution is kind of persistent, doing what deltas do. So it leaves me at a really interesting point. You know, how do we treat this? Um, so one interpretation is that these allogenic signals just simply mimic autogenic processes. You know, an earthquake that triggers an avulsion, the river's gonna avulse anyway. I, I don't think that's 100% true. And I, I'm, this is not my favorite interpretation. The other one that Chris Paola has been putting a, a, a bee in my ear about is thinking about, does the dispersal system simply self-organize around perturbations? That whatever happens, it pretty quickly adjusts its gradient um, and, and disperses its sediment to look like a fairly normal event, just like it would after it would evulse autogenically. So those are the ideas. Um, thanks so much to, to Paul for organizing this and for all the speakers before and after that have made this such a, a cool, cool series. And that's it. Thanks so much. Oh, Steve, that's such a fantastic, it's, it's, it's a great lecture and uh, and you know you make us understand much much better and much much more about the river you know the fluvial system through the delta particularly the tectonic flooding control the monsoon and the amazing the channel migrate and also the ganges from put it together for that holocene fluvial deposits and the dating it's, it's great okay for the, our audience if you have any question you can unmute yourself or you can go ahead or raise the hand if you like and go ahead as i saw somebody already michael you already unmuted do you want to ask a question now or later no i don't i don't i'll, I'll let some other people ask, ask okay any, any yeah this anybody? is going to reshape what i need to talk about when sure. I, oh no i stole it oh, no it's not that, it's not that you stole it, but you brought up so much tectonics. I was going to sort of bypass a lot of the tectonics and concentrate more on things like the substance. But now it's like, okay, I've got to put the tectonics in here too. <laughs> well, very good. Well, uh, I think, you know, uh, 
uh, still we didn't cover too much about the sink part. And uh, I think this is leave a lot of space. We need to invite Carol or Cambly come here to talk about a little bit more, particularly the canyon, how the sediment all the way to the deep sea. So that's, uh, that's very good. Anybody, anybody else have any questions? So Serge, Serge put in a, a question. Um, yeah. Can you identify on your records the stratigraphic signature of the reestablishment of the Asian monsoon during the deglacial period? Um, yes and no. The yes is that right after the younger driest, we now have like 200 radiocarbon ages and a bunch more cores. And the delta just turns on after the younger driest. I mean, we have a bunch of ages right up to like 11.5. Um, and so that's <clears throat> perfect when the climate records show the monsoon turning on. It, it's complicated because it also corresponds to right when, when sea levels pulsing right up. So you're sort of, it's this confluence of sediment coming in and, and really the sea level intersecting the basin. So the, the system just starts aggrading like mad. Um, but certainly the monsoon is right there, so. so it's more, uh, it's more um, sea level than a climatic control, in fact. Well, so uh, here's what I would say as a clear climatic signature, Serge, is that most deltas at, you know, 11,000 year ago, sea level rise rates are just getting transgressed like mad. I mean, they're, they're putting sediment in, they just can't keep up. The difference here is that all of that stored, you know, glacial sediment, once the monsoon turns on, just seems to be flushed out. And so the system's not, uh, you know, translational. It really just aggrades in place. There's very little evidence for, for coastal transgression. So I think that's the clear signature, but certainly partnered with sea level. Okay. Um, James, James Best, go ahead, James, Jim. Hey Steve, hi. Thanks. That was a fantastic talk. Re really, uh, really fascinating. Yeah, I, I, had, I had a couple of questions. Um, uh, the Ganges uh, seismites uh, and those markers there on the paleo bend were fascinating. You, you know, you talked about the orientation of those. Um, what orientation did those dikes have with respect to the um, old paleo bend margin? I just wonder, you know, whether there are. Oh no, they're, yeah, they're orthogonal to it. Yeah, so they're, they're okay. yeah. Yeah, because okay, so, the other okay. bend I, actually comes, yeah. Okay, I was wondering if they're lateral spread features, but that would, that would count that out. Um, and the other thing, in relation to the, um, uh, the, the, the mega floods, um, Given, is there any idea about what the duration of those floods would be, given you know what the discharge was and the likely volume was? I'm just thinking about you know how long those floods would persist in order to get that gravel you know all the way down the system. Yeah, so um, Kate Huntington's current student, I've forgotten her name now, but she, uh, their group is modeling the floods through the gorge which is you know, much better constrained. Um, once you get out on the floodplain, it's, it's a little less clear. Um, but uh, you know, I think, oh, the gravels, I, I should point out, I don't think the gravels are coming from the Himalaya. I think the, the river's picking them up at that bend around the Shillong Massif. There's bedrock that crops up in the middle of the river. So uh, they're, they're probably only getting transported you know, down slope 50, T tens of kilometers, 100 kilometers at most. Right, okay. Okay, thanks, Steve. Hmm. Anybody else? Steve, then what's the lithology of those boulders, do you know, um, and gravels? I mean, would they, because the, if they're picking them off of, of Shillong, the geology might be very different from stuff that's coming from, from farther upstream. Yeah, there, there are some uh, Paleozoic meta sandstones in, in those. So uh, with a nice purple color, it's very characteristic. So um, we should do more work on that. We've never gotten up into a SOM to collect uh, in situ samples, but, um, but they're they seem, and then there's some, some nice stuff. So 
it, it seems consistent with what's on Shalong, but probably need to do a little better. That's good. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Steve. Actually, my, myself, Mohammad Noor Kadir, and I would like to thank you to for the last slide. You mentioned that thank you, and you mentioned in Bangla as well. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yes. Uh, it's, it's really appreciated. Uh, so my question was, uh, it's not about the question. I would say it's more about the meteorological term. Uh, in 2014, I was involved with one of the project and through this project uh, with one of the PhD students from Southampton University, Balaji Angamutu, we tried to collect some soil sample through the tube. I think uh, probably you or Steve Darby was on that team as well. But uh, in, during our field visit, because of those uh, those land was so sandy, like uh, when we try to collect the soil sample by using the tube, we hardly able to capture this. So it was the failed field trip that time, I would say. Uh, we go through a lot of places and try to collect the soil sample, but it, was, it is goes, goes out every time from the tube. Uh, so how do you manage it? Because from your uh, presentation, I think uh, you, you, you ultimately took the sample and do that carbon uh, analysis in your lab, I would say. Right. So how do you ultimately manage it to collect these samples? Well, you'll, you'll know the process well. It's really just the tube well in, installers. Um, these are all the sediment samples are cuttings. Um, they're not in situ, so we don't have bedding and, uh, and boundaries. But thankfully, we've got uh, a really thick sequence and so uh, there, you really don't find units less than a, a meter thick or, or much more typically. So um, it, it's worked out really well. But yeah, for finer resolution and shallow stratigraphy, it's really difficult <laughs> to get samples exactly as you've said. So, um, but yeah, I hope to meet up sometime if you're still working in, on the systems. Yeah, I'm not working with the Wakating University. So yeah, maybe next time. Yeah, see you there. Thank you. Steve, uh, Wayne has a question. Uh, oh, uh, could gravels be transported due to backwater length? Um, oh, good question. So from that um, seismic line, we could see that the, uh, the low stand surface, that gravel surface is about uh, three times steeper. And that could be explained by flexural loading. Um, but then that would mean at the last low stand, it was the same gradient as today. So I think, I don't know, we're kind of perplexed as to why it's not much steeper. Although the section we showed is really just right at the hinge zone. So there may be very little subsidence there. I'm not sure Mike might have a better, better idea, but. Yeah, I mean, there is definitely a break where that line crosses the hinge zone where it's it's flatter and then the surface steepens and the surface steepening is consistent with what we're seeing in sort of the overall subsidence pattern. So I think that is a mixture of the sediment loading and compaction um, steepening that up. Yeah, but certainly the gravels, uh, the head size gravels and the cobbles we had in our cores, I, I don't think there's enough of a tectonic gradient to, to, to generate that, that mm -hmm. transport. Okay, interesting. Hey, Steve, I have also a quick question. You show it amazingly, the uplifted through wheel, even the sandy shore in, the, in your earlier your presentation. So do you think that is caused by the long-term tectonic uplifting or some event driving, but like earthquake? Yeah, uh, I think it's probably a, abrupt events on the hanging wall. I mean, Mike might have a better idea. It does, doesn't seem to, I don't suspect it's slow uplift that it's, uh -huh. it's pulsed events, but we don't know. Uh, are you talking about the Madhapur? Uh, no, I think the, um, the uh, Brahmaputra in the sky, the Garo Hills. Yeah, my internet went out. And so I lost listening to that part of the section. I'm gonna have to go back to the tape. You know, because in, in Taiwan, uh, the white earthquake caused the, the rapid, uh, you know, uplifting of the Da'an, a while of the stream, caused, uh, you know, the river cut down from a huge gorge. It's a very nice, uh, you know, profile. So in this case, we don't, you know, 
we don't know is uh, maybe as you mentioned, suspected it could be a, a event driving like earthquake. And yeah, certainly there's there's meter many meter scale offset uh, yeah. tectonic events even yeah, in you know the, the yeah. This brings to the question about the formation of the near shore offshore the canyon system, because do you think is the canyon formation? Of course, the rapid accumulation is a, is one one you know contribute. Otherwise, it's possible that tech, the some kind of tectonic or earthquake event trigger uplifting maybe because if uplifting the river mouth, then can accelerate help to cut down from the trigger the formation of the canyon. I, I don't know, but uh, what's your opinion? Well, the, the lower delta and, and maybe not the river mouth, but much of the lower delta is just on that trailing uh, edge margin. It's, it's not clear that there's any tectonic reach out that that far from the from the deformation uh -huh. front um, but there uh, as Steve Keel showed on the the marine delta and the subaqueous delta there are those um, the uh, liquefaction features on yeah. the uh, on the subaqueous delta that do seem to be linked to both earthquakes and storms but the the, yeah. the largest ones are, are earthquakes so um, yeah that's interesting very good any anybody else? Do you have any other question? Okay. Yeah, somebody asked us see if we got, you know this presentation available. So I think still you can try maybe make some some copy available. We will deliver through this to this community. And uh, yeah, uh, if if not, this presentation is also available on the YouTube. If you search source to sync, it's a source to sync twenty nine. And uh, so uh, if not, thank you, Steve. And it's very nice. And I hope, uh, you know, everybody can come back this uh, Friday. And as we mentioned, uh, Peter, Peter have another talk, talk about the Yendus River from Himalaya. That will be on the port together. That will be very interesting. Okay. So uh, uh, otherwise, so thank you, Steve, very much. Thank you, all our, you know, Jim, Michael, all our audience, and uh, the great, great, great talk. Yeah, that's Shalom behind me. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's from our, our trip there. <laughs> from, from the cruise. Oh, that's, that's, that's very, very pretty. Okay. Uh, <laughs>